Our first scripture lesson this morning is one verse from Psalm 24, and Tom had put it up there earlier, and it's a wonderful uh, translation. And I have a slightly different one that I'm going to be asking you to repeat later in the service. You, you know it as the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, but there's another he, one that's closer to the Hebrew that I like even better. The earth is the Lord's and all that it holds, all that it holds. And the second reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 20. Jesus told the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard, rented it to tenant farmers, and went on a trip for a long time. When it was time, he sent a servant to collect from the tenants his share of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants sent him away, beaten and empty-handed. The man sent another servant, but they beat him, treated him disgracefully, and sent him away empty-handed as well. He sent a third. They wounded this servant and threw him out. The owner of the vineyard said, what should I do? I'll send my son, whom I love dearly. Perhaps they will respect him. But when they saw him, they said to each other, this is the heir. Let's kill him so the inheritance will be ours. They threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, may this never happen. Staring at them, Jesus said, then what is the meaning of this text of scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be crushed, and the stone will crush the person it falls on. In God's light, let us see light. Will you pray with me? May these words from my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This week, Toni Morrison died. Toni Morrison one of America's greatest writers, compassionate healer of our race-torn nation. In 1993, when she accepted the Nobel Prize for her wonderful novel, Beloved, she spoke about the power of words. Words, she said, can liberate, empower, imagine, and heal. But, cruelly employed, they can render the suffering of millions mute. Words do matter. They matter a great deal. Today, I invite us to consider some words, words that can help us love God's earth more than we do. Love and out of our love, do what we can, what we can. A few years ago, I bought a book called The Lost Words. I brought it up here. I didn't want to stand it up. I was afraid it would fall down in the middle. Uh, it's called The Lost Words, an illustrated dictionary of poetic spells reclaiming the language of nature. The book seems like a children's book, but it is for us grown-ups, too. Robert McFarlane, one of our great nature writers, was alarmed in 2015 when the Oxford English Dictionary, Children's Dictionary, dropped words like fern, willow, and starling, replacing them with words such as broadband, cut, and paste. 
McFarlane, in his book, wanted to, quote, catch at the beauty and wonder, but also the eeriness and otherness of the natural world. These lost words, he says, call up beings that are missing, hidden, and often about to die. If we lose their names, we forget about them. These days, I have been considering the words we use about our dear Earth and its hurt. Couldn't we find words that move our hearts a little more, break our hearts more about what is happening? Now, I know some of you here are scientists and may be profoundly moved by the words that we are using, words like carbon footprint, greenhouse gas emissions, etc. But I confess, I am not so moved. These are not words that open my heart, breaking it. These are not words that powerful, powerfully move me to change my ways. We need to remember the lost words, the vocabulary for all our wondrous plants and animals and rocks in God's kingdom here. Remember and teach our children. If we don't know the name of a bird or the kind of rocks we see all around us, if we don't know the names of what lives in the sea, how can we even see them enough to care about what happens to them? Do we hear the words bluebird, monarch butterfly, polar bear, on television, rarely. With delight and horror, I was stunned a few weeks ago in watching the wonderful PBS series, Planet Earth. I got lost in the animals, their intricate, spectacular, complex beauty, and their heartbreak now. I realized how little I knew about them. I watched walrus, in the Arctic, climbing rock cliffs to try to rest since the water had risen, covering their safer plains. While walruses can climb, they can't descend. When they try to get back into the water, many fall upon the rocks and are killed, about a third of them. This is the real news about God's beautiful kingdom now. Walruses jumping over off of cliffs. Walrus, think about the walrus. What is the old Beatles song? I am the walrus. You are the walrus. We are. But there is more work to do than reclaiming words. Robin Kimmerer, in her magical book, Braiding Sweetgrass, which I understand is a favorite among millennials, talks about how getting a PhD in botany taught her necessary language, but not real language. For that, she says, she has to rely upon her Native American tradition. She has to, as she puts it, learn the grammar of animacy, the grammar of animacy. It is a new grammar. To learn it, we have to listen to other beings. She goes outside, and I quote her here, to nestle in the curve of the roots in a soft hollow of pine needles, to lean her bones against the column of white pine, to turn off the voice in my head until I can hear the voices outside it, the shh of windy needles water trickling over a rock, unquote. Something, she says, that is not me. For which we have no language, the wordless being of others, in which we are never alone. She says, after the drumbeat of my mother's heart, this was my first language. The other morning as I sat in my window overlooking the Sheepscot River, I heard the gulls cawing, as I have so often in my many years here. But this time, I thought, 
I wonder what they are saying to each other. For they have their own language. I wonder. This is harder for us, harder than remembering lost words. Harder to let the voices of plants and animals speak to us in a language that we cannot understand, but in listening to respect them. Some of you may remember a sermon I gave here a couple of years ago, calling up the talking horse, Mr. Ed, remember that? <laughs> About how smart that TV show was. We need to listen to the animals and the plants in God's kingdom. Some scientists say they even know what we are thinking. The crows, the jays, the ravens, the apes, the monkeys, and even our dogs. Now there is a scary thought. <laughs> so reclaiming lost words, listening for languages spoken by God's other beings. But there is one more thing one more thing we need to do. I think this may be the hardest thing to do. This lesson is from our Bible, this hardest lesson. The parable that Jesus gives us fleshes out the psalm verse, the earth is the Lord's and all that it holds. Jesus' parable shows us one word, the one word above all words, we have to get rid of when we think about ourselves in relationship to God's kingdom here. One word. I want you to listen for the word as we revisit Luke. Let me reread re a few verses again. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. Jesus puts us in a vineyard. Many people, of course, worked in them in his time. Jesus might put us in an office, a farm, a school, any of our workplaces. People are busy at work. They are very productive, taking much pride in how much they have accumulated. They have become rich, decorating their homes, saving for their future, perhaps hoarding, building more and more barns, adding to their 401ks, buying yachts and expensive cars. They know what is theirs. They know their boundary lines. They keep trespassers out. They rely on the police. They are us. But then one day in Jesus' story, the owner of the vineyard sends a servant to collect, to collect what the tenants have accumulated. The tenants' reaction? Stand your ground. Using the weapons of the time, they beat the servant. The owner tries again. They beat another one. And a third time, all of them cast out, wounded, likely bloody. Then the owner says, I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. How do the tenants respond? Let us, they say, kill him. He is the heir. Killing him, the inheritance will be ours. And they do kill him, God's beloved son. The owner's judgment is swift and merciless. The tenants will be destroyed. They will be broken on the cornerstone. They will be broken on the first and most crucial stone of any foundation, that which makes every building true and right. They will be broken and ground to powder on it. And the cornerstone is Jesus. 
This parable is often called the parable of the wicked tenants. Wicked, what a wonderful underused word. Although I was talking with someone last week and they pointed out to me, no, not in Maine. <laughs> Everything is wicked good, wicked, you know. But it is a wonderful word. Now as we look at this parable, it is easy to distance ourselves. Why, we are not wicked. Are we? We don't murder. But we do live by that word, don't we? That one word all the time, the word that will destroy us and God's world. world. For us, this word is our cornerstone, the stone upon which we have built the lives that we live. The word is ours, our ours, or more often, mine. Mine, we say my house, my garden, my stuff, my bank account. I own it, it is mine. Even if we have a landlord, we say my house, my apartment. We don't say we are brief tenants. We don't say it belongs to God. It all belongs to God, but it does. The owner does come back. And there is a time of reckoning. What will we have to give God of our labors, our use of land, our treatment of animals? What will we say on the day of reckoning, which so many feel is faster and faster approaching? Since I started meditating on Jesus' words, I have been trying to eliminate the word from the, this word our, from the language that I use. It feels almost impossible. I love what I think I have made, and I have helped build the houses that we live in. I confess to house pride. I try, I am trying to say instead, everything I think I have, I think I own, is the Lord's. I try to say instead, the house is the Lord's, the clothes on my back, the car that I drive, the land that I live on, all is the Lord's. The earth is the Lord's, and all that it holds, all of it, all of it. Let us say together in closing, the earth is the Lord's, and all that it holds. Amen.